thanks for coming back, and uh, thanks for being present, uh, and gratitudes for uh, all of the bodies in the room, uh, and gratitudes for all of the unseen bodies in the room. Um, I think uh, just briefly, briefly before I before we start the artist presentations, I'm gonna also talk about the format because we're gonna switch it up just a little bit. Um, but I just want to say that uh, it's very important when artists, when we get to hear artists talk about their work, it's actually a privilege. The sacred space of the uh, studio, if you are working in the studio, or the sacred space of working on the land, or the sacred space of working in community, uh, really um, is the fire. Often it's hard for artists to articulate this because it, it's, a, it's an experience which is being moderated and motivated and moved through not just the intellect and the voice, but uh, something sometimes known as intuition, um, spirit body, emotional body, physical bodies. Uh, so I just want to say that to you all. I know there's a lot of students in the room, but there's a lot of community members in this room also. Um, the other thing that's very important here is that I just want to really articulate, try to articulate this. Uh, the organizers of this, uh, this uh, iteration of the summer intensive have really uh, gathered very important voices. I think we're also looking at uh, how this, I'm reflecting right now, reflecting now on how this gathering makes me think, oh, is this off now? Did... Okay, I'm super loud. <laughs> I just want to point this out to you folks, the folks in the room. Um, indigenous art world in general is a constant, fluid, uh, moving uh, entity. Uh, but I, I want to really applaud the uh, organizers for gathering folks who are making different kinds of spaces, new kinds of spaces. Uh, and for me, as someone who's been around for a little bit of time, uh, what I feel when I listen to the panels, the keynotes, uh, is that this is the next iteration. So please pay attention. Uh, I'm going to invite the panelists up one at a time. I'm going to start by reading their bios because uh, maybe you didn't. Yeah, and I want to also say, please read their bios. Start the research now. Right. Uh, be a part of the conversations around Indigenous art in Canada, in North America, uh, in the world. Right. Because if you're not interested and you're not participating, Indigenous art conversations are not going to wait for you. Okay, I'm going to start by inviting uh, Michelle up. I'm going to read her bio, uh, and then it's go time. So Dr. Michelle Jack, you're the Seelix Okanagan person from the communities of Penticton, D.C. and Olmack, Washington. She has her Ph.D. from Washington State University and, and is a working abstract image maker scholar who has a BFA from the University of New Mexico and an MFA from the University of Washington, both in studio arts and photography. She uses her traditional Celix experiences to enhance her artistic practice and teaching methods as current head of the Visual and Creative Arts at Inalkin Center in Penticton on Penticton Indian Band Reserve. As an abstract image maker scholar uh, who investigates the physical, mental, spiritual, uh, and material. Over the years, as an image maker scholar, uh, Michelle has dwelt into uh, some sensory uh, senses more than others when making distinct bodies of work that have to do with uh, many different living land memories and parts of Celix Okanagan indigenous culture to respect our mother earth, creator, and ancestors when creating work sustainably has to be considered in every sense or area of life. 
the, the knowledges of our people, language and culture are intertwined with the ideas uh, of holistic methods and processes. Uh, her role as an indigenous uh, and mixed race artist dealing with her culture is to present a view of our transforming communities. We are peoples of continuous cyclical change. Modern tools and technologies are the way we show how our people reconstruct, recycle, and transform the materials and tools in front of us uh, to actively participate in our traditional cultures in the world of balance. Repurposing is an active living tradition. We are actively listening. Living. Okay, we're going to start with a video, uh, but if we could welcome Michelle to the stage. So to us, really, I'm talking to most of the people in this world that really doesn't exist. It's really just an invisible line. They have no domain, no domain over anything. It's no constant, no creator. The creator put our people here to honor. We're here to look after it, to keep strong for our children, generations. 
just to use all of them right away and turn them up and speed up. So we did it well. The whole order um, is really, uh, it's frustrating. The, the border issue is uh, something that is always going to be there, it's always going to be an issue. On well, about the 49th parallel in the border, uh, uh, it's mostly been an inconvenience. I'm not as pretty as here. 500 years. We wrote a lot of books. When is he going to start listening to his books? If he's so smart and why is the land sick? Why is the land polluted? It's invented by our people. And that it's something that we have to start looking at. Why has Hall in Chai squeezed Michelle Jack Olson Pete? Um, this is um, in our instruction language, um, the more elaborate formal introduction. Can tell Sun Pinkton on the speech. I'm from Sun Pinkton, Penticton, British Columbia, and the um, speech, which is Omak, Washington. Um, the beginning of the video was uh, a project that I did for my dissertation about um, the issues of the 49th parallel in our traditional um, silk territory, in our Kokonaki. So um, this is something that impacts all of our families and our people uh, every day, continuously. Um, everyone has family on the other side of the border in every one of our communities. And there's different, many different uh, stories and teachings about all kinds of issues that that has brought about within our people. And a lot of times um, when people think of borderland issues, they always think of just the southern borderland issue. But living in New Mexico and um, having uh, family and my sons are Dene, but from the southwest. And so... Um, and having lots of uh, family, friends, and stuff who have also shared many uh, border lands uh, narratives with me. I can say that honestly, all those issues are very similar, um, including, including all of the issues with militarization and incarceration and all of those things. And no matter where those um, imaginary lines are on either side of the U.S., um, or the 49th parallel, or the parallel that um, cuts through Tejas and New Mexico and all of those places, um, they're just arbitrary, right? They're not necessarily about um, land formations or where traditional people's boundaries were or where their um, mountain formations were where they had negotiated spaces with each other as tribal peoples um, to naturally go with the living land. So because of that, it ends up um, complicating many things, right? There, uh, there's lots of families that end up being separated from each other or parts of their family being separated. And so I just wanted to give voice to a lot of those things uh, within our people because as um, a silk or a coconut king person I have lived and traveled um, throughout our valley my whole life and that is just part of our narrative of, of being who we are is that we have to negotiate that um, issue with militarization and borders all of the time. It is something that we live every day. So our children now have to have to deal with that. And I was listening to lots of narratives um, 
of our people talking about like how the border has changed, um, how the militarization and levels of it has gone up and down and all of those things that impact us. So like for instance, um, my grandmother um, to not have her youngest set of children taken from her to be put in residential school anymore. She moved across this, the border in our southern territory in Brewster, Washington, so that my father and the younger five kids that she had went to high school and stuff in the States. Um, they moved strategically at a point when all of them had just come home from residential school and then they moved there so that they could uh, make a living within, because all of the migrant work and everything that's now done by lots of other peoples that come into our territory now, um, all the silk people used to do all of that work. Um, whether it was in, <coughs> in this um, central part of the valley, the northern part of the valley, or across in the state side where all of the the fruit and all of those things that everybody loves so much, right? So uh, I just want you to know, like, that's just part of our narratives, and I was giving space to them for that. But all the different pieces that I have um, that were going in the background are just like a, a wide variety of the things that I do. So um, I am a mixed media artist and and interdisciplinary scholar, so it just depends on um, what I, my subject is, what um, it tells me that I need to make. So um, lately, my series of work is um, a lot about um, still going back to layering images again, still images, and uh, doing a lot of work from speaking about different land formations within the Okanagan, um, layered over each other and their sacred spaces to us. Um, and then I did a couple mural projects. So there's a mural that's in Penticton um, that went up, um, and, it, and it says in our language, um, healing energy for all living things. And because those spaces have been so um, separated from our people as far as like um, city centers and all of that. There's not a lot of um, still artwork there. There's just only now been a revitalization of encouragement and production of having our artists actually have some pieces within the city centers and stuff. So that mural is a is a big feat. There was a mural previously in the 60s that actually had um, the Rotary Fathers asked to be taken down. So um, it's quite a big action that that is there now. And then there's a, a good sculpture by um, one of our one of our PIB members, um, Clint, and his metal works are um, beautiful. But anyway, so those are just some of the things that that I do, and this is short snippet. This is a mural that we um, did at the Tony Only Project. I did with Joseph Sanchez and Sherry Boyle that we sent to um, the tiny houses, and they actually had up in the back of their statements some when they um, were speaking on October 31st, 2017, and they've taken it to a bunch of different actions, which was really great. Um, and I particularly did the salmon, and I was talking to um, these two other artists about that, how, well, it has to be specific to their people. You can't just put any kind of salmon there. You have to put the salmon that they are, have a relationship with. So it's, it's, the, it's their salmon. And so, um, but it's a painting of the eagle's green because Sherry was like, this is supposed to be an image of how of before contact, right? Of like how when the land was healthy and we're asking those things to come back, right? So, but this is a, another mural that's been very helpful. So, this is the downtown mural that's in Penticton. And the, like the process of us, what we were doing with that. And this is one of the pieces I was speaking about that is about the 
Tumkula. This is it says Tumkula if Uhokanakin, which that that word is um, isn't just necessarily a place name. It's about it's about um, messengers and actually um, that the word Okanagan or Okanakin is actually about um, when someone needed a message from the top of like the mountain to the rest of the people that they would come down and be the messengers to them. So it's not necessarily our silk word for ourselves, but um, that's this is an embodiment of like two or three um, places that are layered upon each other. So. And then that's about um, having the life wrap brought back into the rivers to bring the salmon chiefs back. And this is about <clears throat> like resurgence of our um, interconnected indigenous peoples throughout the entire Turtle Island, north and south, and um, because there used to be other people, this is actually like a, a Hopi dancer, but they used to travel all the way from that far south to visit uh, Spotted Lake to wash their their ceremonial things there. And we had lots of rigorous um, commerce between all our peoples, uh, north, south, east, west, all the way to the Arctic. So that's just a, an image about that resurgence, right? Those reconnections, the reconnections that we're making now, even in, in our, uh, in this residency with all of the artists that haven't um, met each other before or know of each other's work. So it's been really, really helpful to have those discussions about, about those things and the embodiment of, of everything that you do or where you're at or where you stand. And a lot of times um, I like to put in people's mind, depending on where you're at, um, in, in whatever space that you are, whether you're um, a university student or um, another person in someone else's territory, just thinking about what your relationship is to the space that you're standing and, and what you either know or don't know about that space or the people that that space belongs to. So um, this piece is about the issue with um, ice and, and on the southern border stealing all of the children and the people right now that that's the most impacted population of people is actually all indigenous, right? So this mother has her, um, is missing her hands because her impact and agency is taken from her temporarily to save her children from that space. And a lot of times when um, there's fish out for market, you know, they're gutted and displayed, right? And a lot of times right now what's going on with that is there's been lots of talk and things about them even putting the people in um, not just detention, how we're losing children there, but also um, trafficking them. So even from those spaces, right? So that's, that's what that piece is about. But I just wanted to share um, a few of those things with you, and I can share the long narrative about that piece later, but I just wanted to um, let you see the gamut of which the place that I stand in. And I'm really grateful and uh, privileged privilege that I get to come here and speak um, from the land that I'm from and speak and share my work with you. So. Thank you all for coming, and I look forward to hearing about all the other artists. Okay, thanks everybody. So, artists will be coming back at the end. Um, I'd like to, uh, to get to that in one sec here. The next person I'd like to call forward to share their words with us is uh, Ryan Federson. Uh, 
Ryan, Ryan. <laughs> Elizabeth Benison uh, is from the Confederated Tribes of the Colville, Okanagan, Arrow Lakes, Ger and, er and German and French. She's a mixed media installation artist who specializes in interactive and immersive artworks that invite audience engagement. Federson received a Bachelor of Fine Arts at Cornish, 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 you can say Cornish College uh, of Arts in 2009. She was inspired to create interactive and temporary artworks as a way to honor an indigenous perspective on the relationship between art, the artist, and the community. Her approach emphasizes humor, play, and creative engagement to create opportunities for personal introspection uh, and discovery. Cultivating a great engagement with the contemporary indigenous art world has been a transformative way that Federson has connected with her culture, uh, cultural heritage and dismantled, dismantled her American uh, cultural indoctrination. <laughs> wow. <laughs> please, please come forward. Everybody, let's welcome Ryan. much for inviting me to, re to return. Um, as a respect for you guys' time, and I know that there's some high school students from last year, I decided to really focus on projects from the last year, only diverging once into a previous project. But I'm going to start with talking about an ongoing project I work on called Coyote Now. And I was last year while I was here, I was working on my largest iteration of it yet, which was a 72-foot long um, interactive coloring mural. Uh, Coyote Now is based on uh, Coyote as a figure, uh, the trickster figure from Plateau Lore, and largely around this idea that Coyote is immortal. The Sweat Lodge, knowing that Coyote would, as a figure of mischief, would often get himself in a lot of trouble, um, made Coyote uh, able to come back as long as any scrap of fur, bone, or whisker remained. Um, and so I've continued on with that metaphor, relating it to creativity. And so I start with the cast crayon set of Coyote's bones, thinking as long as we're still creative with Coyote, he continues to be immortal. And then I created a series of uh, interactive coloring installations that have new vignettes of Coyote's adventures. Um, and so in this one, Coyote Epic, um, the, there's a series of about five Coyote stories that travel throughout the space. And then the audience is invited to take his bones, the vehicle of his immortality, and to uh, bring the imagery to life. So this image, this uh, setting starts with uh, with Coyote's death. Often the beginning of an epic is with Coyote being brought back to life. And so we see that Coyote has uh, wandered onto the Hanford Reservation, which is a super fun site in Washington. Um, I actually recently learned this summer that um, my uh, mother has been has been studied for the effects of uh, Hanford on her. Uh, pancreas and endocrine system, and recently survived pancreatic cancer. So that was kind of a um, crazy revelation. But so this actually starts with Coyote, um, who has gotten ill on the Hanford Reservation and is being brought back by Fox. Um, he then uh, starts to wander home, where he gets into a big fight with his wife Mole. He's been gone a long time. He didn't tell her where she was, where he was going, and so um, he's chasing after her, tunneling through the earth, and uh, after their big fight, the giant sinkhole forms, and it's, uh, it's not fracking, it's coyote and, coyote and um, mole in a, in a giant fight. And it's kind of like <laughs> looking at these ways to think about coyote and uh, storytelling, uh, imaginative storytelling, as a way to dig into our contemporary actions, um, to, think, to think about these um, larger systems and our relationship to them and to use Coyote to model our mistakes. And so throughout this, we have Coyote involved with um, 
uh, hampered in the nuclear reservation, fracking. Um, in this case, Coyote's falling asleep on the job and he gets fired. Uh, he's trying to make a little bit of extra money, so he goes on the internet to Reddit and he finds a place that's offering to, to pay him cash to help uh, help some political stories go viral. But uh, he gets busted by the FBI, and you can see them. He goes on the run, they're going out through a chase, but he his adventure ends in this case at a Bears Ears Park where his campsite is demolished while they're putting in oil rigs. So this last couple images are from the Coloring Inn. Um, this one shows the edge of a uh, coyote um, chasing the wall, tunneling through the ground, and then the colored in version of coyote being fired. <laughs> and um, one thing that's really fascinating about these projects is um, every different every community brings different things to the story and in this case you see the reference to Melania's jacket. Uh, this is a piece called Kill the Indian Save the Maya and it was part of the part of the Borderlands exhibition for the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture and this was a piece that was inspired by conversations around um, the disruption of continuous culture from from the boarding school system. Um, so my grandfather, uh, great grandfather Jack Alec, was at Kamloops. Um, my grandfather, grandmother Jeannie Alec, was at St. Mary's, and um, my father wasn't allowed to speak his language or speak to his grandmother because she was so afraid that he would be taken. And the way that this continues generationally to um, separate people from their culture and their family, um, I think, is epidemic. But it's also something that's not particularly discussed in um, an educational setting, particularly um, in the U.S. I know that's not exactly the same case in Canada. But um, this project was kind of about um, uncovering that history. And so I created a map of the United States where I attempted to track down all of the, the, the boarding schools. I was able to find about uh, 212, um, but it took a lot of digging. There's often disguised as military schools, religious schools, and industrial schools, primarily because they were either looking to convert, create soldiers, or um, use uh, slave labor. And so in this project, I've uh, created this map somewhere on Google. Someone at the Google Maps, someone is very confused because the map still exists that I used to create this information. And then I translated it into a wall treatment that uses a, a material called thermochromic ink. And so in this image, I've re-redacted all of the names of the schools and through your body heat you can touch, press, and rub and you can um, uncover this information. I wanted to address this history because it was you know, personal and something that I was thinking very much about how it affected the way that I was raised, how it affected my father and his mother and her father, um, but I also didn't want to make a project that would just re-traumatize and kind of revel in trauma for, for audiences to consume. Um, and so I made the project a little bit more like a mapping. As you walk into the space, you see something that's, in, that's being obscured from you, that's prolific all across the United States. Um, but then it's only through your personal investigation that you can discover what this hidden history is. And I was really impacted by the power of naming. Um, when I made the piece, I didn't quite realize how important that aspect of it would be. And throughout the, the two installations of this piece, um, I was really struck by all the conversations that came from it, specifically from people feeling ownership through the name. My, my, I went to this school, my mother went to this school, my grandmother went to this school, and how much that um, invited people to, to talk about their experiences. Um, this is a recent project that I was uh, wrapping up just as I arrived last year called the Post-Human Archive. Um, and this was a part of a larger project called Double Exposure, which was commemorating the quincentennial of Edward Curtis's birth. Yeah. So, Edward Curtis was a, a amateur ethnographic photographer who, and this is a really important part that is almost never mentioned, was paid by... Uh, Theodore Roosevelt and J.P. Morgan to create the documentation of the vanishing race. Um, this was a project that had a lot to do with social Darwinism and this idea of photographing um, 
tribes, people from across the United States, and showing their incompatibility with a uh, modern industrialized contemporary world. And so while he could, so you see this in his, one of his famous quotes, in, in Curtis's view, the Indians, their present was all of decline, the future of practically non-existent, and the past glorious. Well, um, despite being marketed, especially now, as a historic document, it was very much not. You see, there's multiple instances of him editing out the use of technology. You can see in this image he's editing out an uh, alarm clock. Um, he also created a uh, dramatized uh, film, which the Smithsonian, Smithsonian still has listed as a documentary. And he coined the term the vanishing race, which we all know is bullshit. <laughs> And so thinking about that and thinking about these exhibitions that are somewhat celebrating his work but also taking a critical lens to it, um, I was invited by, and this is, a, sorry, this is an image from the Library of Congress's website of his images where you see these often using backdrops um, and, and uh, the subjects are reducing people to types often describing the things that they're wearing or the places that they're from and not very specific to the individual people. And so. Um, I was invited by the Seattle Art Museum to um, create the educational experience that people would go into as they left the, uh, their double exposure exhibition. This exhibition also included um, Marianne, Marianne Nicholson, who's going to be here I think next week, as well as Tracy Rector and Will Wilson. And they, they kind of intermixed the work of contemporary artists with Edward Curtis's work. But then as you left, you encountered this room which had a voice that sounded a lot like Siri. And she would say, welcome to the Post-Human Archive, a historical <coughs> preservation project brought to you by the Children of the Singularity and AI Center for Ethnography. Our mission is to record uh, the final example of biological human life for the sake of posterity. We are so excited to document you, a prime example of a real life human being for our archives. I wanted to imagine a way to put to change people's perspective on Edward Curtis from this um, this documentarian making this, this wonderful historic record to what he was, which was a person representing a a uh, oppressive dominant um, culture coming in and saying, "You're not going to be here anymore. <laughs> We're going to be here now, and this is your this is you're done." And so I kind of projected a sci-fi lens on that and said that the, the AI people are about to do that to us. No reasoning, no evidence, I'm just telling you this is now how it is. And then the audience was invited to put themselves into um, settings that I set up for them. One was a kind of creepy abandoned office because I figured where did AI think we live in front of a computer? Or perhaps outdoors, some, some hints to this dystopic um, future. We've got the outdoor setting and then these kind of beautiful uh, fluffy clouds that you then realize are coming from the paper mill in Tacoma where I live. And so throughout the exhibition people documented themselves and then um, the when they used a public hashtag I would then go through and collect them and um, translate them into my own archive. Um, I based all of the information on um, Edward Curtis's uh, the titles of his portfolios and kind of the reductive ways of uh, creating subjects. Some of them were kind of fun to be the same, because one of them was leggings, because leggings was also in the Library of Congress's sorting. And the people of, of Stone, the Indians of Stone Houses became the people of glass offices. Um, the head, the, the headhunters became uh, trend hunters, and so forth. And then I also used a, a similar lens to change the chief's daughter to the CEO daughters. The um, water cooler banter, a fashionista, kind of reducing people to my assumptions about them, and they had no recourse to um, make any alterations. Once they submitted, I would write whatever I wanted about them, and they had no say. So this is some of the documentation from that project. Um, this is a project, Squeeze, that was commissioned for uh, Bellwether, which was a, a um, interactive art and sculpture festival in Bellevue, uh, Washington. Um, and so in Bellevue is an area of massive growth and wealth. Um, it's an area where there's a lot of pressure on a um, ever displaced um, lower and middle classes. And so in reflecting that I created this project Squeeze where I roamed throughout the museum, city, park, and extended area 
and became uh, began acquiring things. Um, I had a uh, I had a boss. He was market forces, and he would just basically yell at me to pointing out things that we were then going to acquire, and then uh, price and sell. Throughout the exhibition, I claimed the rights to bike racks, to um, wheelchair access, to water, to journalism, to uh, put a cell phone tower in the park, um, to large trees and memorial benches. And then throughout the about week and a half, I continuously escalated the prices until they were sold to um, mysterious buyers. Um, and lastly, my last minute and a half, uh, I'm going to make a pitch for the exhibition I currently have at the Alternator Center for Contemporary Art, which is called Seeking Visions for a Better World. And this is a project that is largely a response to the kind of proliferation of dystopic visions that we've been seeing in both literature, movies, pop culture, and media. We see it a lot in the news. Um, but the thing is, is that when you only know what you're trying to get away from, it's really hard to, point, to give yourself something to point towards. And so I wanted to ask people to think about um, what, are, what, are, what are better futures that we could be working towards. Like how do you envision a, a positive future as opposed to a dystopic one. And so this is a uh, call. And so up until the 21st, which is this Sunday, I, I will be collect, um, receiving submissions. Uh, I think I've received about 50 so far, and they've been wonderful and interesting and bizarre. Um, and so if you're interested in submitting, um, there's a website there. You can probably also snap a picture, and the QR code will probably work. I'm not standing in front of it. Um, and I'm accepting words, images, sentiments. You can draw directly into the form. And everything that I receive, I'm, tra I'm translating into um, vinyl and kind of plastering throughout the space. The idea is to reflect both um, traditional, uh, traditional pictographic wall where people are responding to each other, sharing their visions, um, as well as graffiti culture where we, people kind of spill out their secrets, guts, and desires on a communal space. So um, thank you so much for your time and attention. Okay, wonderful. This is uh, eventually we're all going to talk to each other. So, but right now we're introducing our project projects and practices. And uh, the next person I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, is Wes Harmon. I'm going to read their bio and then uh, call Wes up to the stage. <laughs> Wes Harmon, uh, they them pronouns is mixed race, uh, trans non binary, uh, two spirit artist from the carrier. With TAP First Nations, and a graduate of Emily Carr's University, Emily Carr University's Bachelor of Fine Arts program. They are currently living and working on the territories of Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil Nations uh, in the Squatches Lodge Artist Residency Program. Their ongoing work includes beadwork and DIY strategies around punk aesthetics, creating the Potlatch Pot Punk series, a collection of modified and embellished jackets that blend traditional materials with punk and DIY approaches to discuss urban indigenous identity, representations, and understandings of wealth. Their poetry and text-based projects continually seek to explore the possibilities of recipro reciprocity, uh, recipro <laughs> engagement. Why is it so hard for me to talk today? It's strange. Uh, in the dialogue, in, di in the dialogue, and aim to subvert and confront the assumptions made in consuming indigenous voices and work. Let's put our hands together to welcome Wes. <laughs> How do I make this the big thing? <laughs> 
Hadi Sunsen, my name is Wes Harmon, and I'm from the Carrie Witt Nation. Um, thank you so much, Peter, for the introduction. But also, I just want to say thank you so much for um, the introduction before we even started coming on stage about explaining how it's kind of hard uh, to share things as a creator and as an artist and then translate it into these talks and things because that is a really like big, different kind of spaces that you're working from. Um, so thank you. <laughs> uh, you'll probably hear me pause a lot. It's like I'm practicing to be an elder early where I just have to think about all my words first. <laughs> um, so uh, I'd really like to start with a land acknowledgement as well. And uh, we are on Sili uh, territory. And although I don't think it's very evident in all of my work, like I do try to think about what it means to be a guest on other people's territory. I've lived in Vancouver for about 10 years now uh, with a brief sojourn up north in Prince George, which is also not my territory. So I think a lot of the work that I make kind of has this angst about not being able to return home. Um, so the places where I do end up are really important to me because they hold me in a certain way and shape my work. Um, and I like bringing my family into my presentation. So this is a picture from when we were living in Prince Rupert. That's my mom, our friend Lily, and that's my sister and I. My sister is the one glaring. I'm much more <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and So just to, instead of awkwardly trying to explain for Fort Babine is I put this map here. So, um, you can see like Vancouver to Fort Babine is a pretty big trip, uh, but Fort Babine is where our traditional village is, which is called Latatnake, and that means the capital of fish, which is very endearing, but also very like, there's an ego in that of just like, where you make the best fish. Um, <laughs> and like, historically we are known for the trade of our dried fish, and we're tradespeople more so than anything. Um, I keep hitting the wrong key. Uh, again, again, so I like to include my family in my work in some way, because a lot of my process of working is about including my family and spending time with them when I can't do it physically and in person. Um, and I also really like to try and focus more on uh, celebratory views of my family, the things that really um, are home for me. So this is my Uncle Sonny um, with bottle caps in his eyes. It's a part of a series I did called uh, Souvenirs from Home where I was taking family archival photos and then turning them into postcards because uh, I was in Banff at the time and the thing about like a lot of souvenir shops is they all have the same postcards um, and they always have the same Indians on the same postcards, even if that's not the territory they're from. So I was trying to envision, <laughs> I was trying to envision a series of postcards that would be better representative of my own family and our own territory and the things that I hold dear about that. Uh, so this one's another one from that series. Uh, these are, I don't know all of the people in them, but. They're always tagged as the Babine boys, and they're from the archive from the Lajac Residential School photos. And uh, there's a site where a lot of the students who formerly attended the school have been compiling these photographs, and um, my community hasn't been especially involved, so I think that's why we often just get tagged as the Babine boys, and kind of these stories about being rowdy and sort of, I don't know, the cool kids that you didn't get to sit at the table with. Um, and it, it's hard to look at these photos because I really love this photo um, of the boys together and like they're posing and they're smiling and, but the reality is that they were there as a part of the residential school and so looking at these photos is really difficult. Um, this is definitely one of the lighter ones. And looking at photos like this, I just can't help but feel at least grateful that they had each other in that way, in that situation. Um, 
And it's just, yeah, I find like I often approach my work with this kind of joyful, like really excited way of diving in, but it kind of get disrupted often when you're looking at things like this. Uh, I also think a lot about the relationships that I don't have. So my grandmother uh, passed away when my mom was quite young, and she's not someone that I've ever met, but she's someone who's very present in all of our lives. Like, her absence is just as present as if she was there in some ways. And we still call it Grandma's Smokehouse. This is where we do all our fish every year. Um, and this was, I really like this postcard because like part of doing the postcard series was like looking at the really bad designs. Um, so like the super <laughs> 90s or earlier, just lo-fi everything where it's like this photo is not a good photo in many ways, but I love it. Um, and then using different kind of texts. Um, so text is also something that I use quite a lot. This is from my grad project five years ago. Yeah. Um, a lot of my work is derivative from reading academic texts and kind of picking out the things that really stand out to me. And this is from a text by Angela Davis where she was talking about the forced sterilization of black women, which was such a devastating text to be reading. Um, but I guess... I felt this kind of like, I felt a little bit insulated from it, like I was a little bit safe because it wasn't my community. But then at the end of the, by by time you get to the end of the text, I got totally sucker punched because she started talking about how this was also happening within indigenous communities. And through reading that kind of text, it's hard not to think about sort of the impossibilities that it happened to ensure your existence. Like the fact that I am here when I'm not supposed to be here is just really overwhelming sometimes. Um, so I was trying to take that feeling of kind of despair and translate it into something that I could really hold on to and that's really important to me. And at the time that I was reading this text and I was in school, a lot of my cousins were starting to have their first kids. Um, so this one's beautiful brown babies. Um, it's the most beautiful thing in the world to me. Uh, so the main project I think that gets a lot of attention from my work is the Potlatch Punk series. Um, I live in Vancouver, so it's a very urban context. Um, I spend a lot of my time going to shows, like concerts, um, being in the like zine, uh, like self-publishing kind of community, but there's not a huge indigenous presence in that. So the first jacket was actually not intended as a part of the series whatsoever. It was very much just, I wanted my own damn denim jacket that like, could assert my identity in these places um, so people would stop asking where I'm from. Um, but one of the nice kind of like side effects of that was like having the Tribe Called Red shirt that I cut up and making it into a back patch meant that I was starting to meet other Indigenous people who I wouldn't have normally had the guts to talk to. I used to be really, really shy. Like, I kept telling people earlier about the first talk I ever gave, which was unfortunately recorded at the BAM Center. I almost, <laughs> I almost blacked out before I got up on stage. <laughs> so, so it's gotten better. Um, the first jacket I started working with formally was the... This jacket here, um, my sister had, you can't really see it, but it's a pink jacket. Pink is my favorite color. Um, my sister gave it to me because she wasn't really wearing it, and we were talking about, like, oh, how cool it'd be to, like, make really cool beaded punk jackets. Um, so I finally just got to the point where I just had to start it so that I could see what it looked like as I was going. And I had to relearn how to bead. I was taught quite young by my aunt. We used to do fairs and like sell um, beaded lighter cases and stuff like that at craft fairs. Um, but <laughs> I had to relearn and this took much longer than it would take me now. It spent 80 hours just doing the beadwork part of it. And then the next piece that I added on top of it, um, which is about the same size, if not bigger, took me 30 hours, so like, much less time. Um, but regardless, like spending the time on these jackets is something that's really important to me because again, it's a way of uh, kind of grounding myself and thinking about my family and 
this is probably my favorite jacket that I've done so far, just because it is about my sister and the conversations that we have together. Uh, we're both super into sci-fi and horror, and as I was doing the uh, UFO portion of the jacket, um, we were talking on the phone, and I jokingly said about some movie, like, yeah, tell me about First Contact, because a lot of these science fiction stories are essentially just First Contact stories, <laughs> and I can't help but, like, yeah. Uh, root for the wrong people sometimes or like you know you're presented like this is the hero and you're like no that's a colonizer man <laughs> um, and the same thing comes up with horror films as well like more often than not once like something indigenous gets introduced into the story my sister and I are like ah no let them die like <laughs> let the Indians rest <laughs> uh, but as I was starting to spend a lot of time on these jackets I did have to start thinking about how that was relating to our traditional practices and our regalia in our territory is really reflective of being tradespeople so we have a kind of mishmash of everything like uh, one of my favorite ones you can't see in this picture but there's like a bear on the back of the blanket that's just entirely made of sequins like it's a photorealistic bear but it's sequined <laughs> um, so as I've been going to continue making the jackets, I think I'm sort of working towards this goal of having a bunch of them and being able to hold, uh, have them danced into a space, but I need a lot of them so it looks impressive. So I've just been slowly plucking away at that. Um, this one I made when I was out on in Banff again, and often when I'm in the prairies, people will speak Cree to me, which is very sweet, but I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> So I made this one to just signify I was more coastal. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so these jackets do get worn. Uh, this is a terrible photo, um, but it says, Our blood runs the redder. This is my Buffy St. Marie jacket. She is the grandest auntie of them all. She's been doing it the best for so long. Um, so I had to make a jacket that was about one of her songs. And I chose one of the saddest songs. Um, it's my country, tis of thy people, you're dying. Um, and I just remember she was performing it at National Aboriginal Day a couple years ago, um, and like they kept doing shots of people in the audience, and everyone was crying. <laughs> <laughs> so powerful lady. Uh, this jacket is the newest one. It's only pre been presented once. I was just recently invited to stop me on the Norwegian side of the border for an exhibition, and this jacket I kind of made with the curator in mind who I also met at Banff um, and she's really focused on indigenous feminism so uh, the text is derived from an essay by Gina Starblanket in the Making Space for Indigenous Feminisms book, the second edition. Uh, so it says indigenous feminists unruly, out of order, and above all threatening and it's just talking about how disruptive feminism still is in our communities um, and how it can often be con uh, perceived as being almost like anti-indigenous in ways of um, this is such a big conversation to get into but like you want to have a unified front so that we can all get something together but when you have feminism coming into spaces and calling out men who have uh, enacted lateral violences that can be seen as breaking apart the community, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, I'm going to quickly blast through these in my last two minutes. I work really kind of in a lot of different ways, so you often have, end up with messes like this, uh, which get made into formal messes like this. Uh, this was for a show curated by Joy Arcand about indigenous text, and this particular piece doesn't exist anymore because we paste rots and smells gross. Uh, so we have to throw it away at the end of the exhibition, but that kind of was really nice uh, and poetic because the space we were showing in was also demolished shortly after we had our exhibition in it. Uh, so it was made up of a lot of smaller pieces. Um, I really like this one because it uh, also just thinks about like how you conduct yourself as a guest on people's territories. 
I do a lot of zines, and I thought I should talk about them a little bit in case you're thinking of coming to the workshop. Um, I really like zines for the reason of kind of reinterpreting spaces that maybe weren't made for us. Um, and when I say us for myself, I mean queer Indigenous people. Um, but they're also like, they're good ways to work through things. Like these two on the bottom here are about bad breakups and being bad at dating. <laughs> So there's a place for humor in them. Um, there's places to be abstract. There's places to draw, draw Mothman's butt. Uh, <laughs> I do comics. I'm working slowly on a comic called Cryboy that is a post-apocalyptic feature that's not sad or creepy and dominated by men, hopefully not. Um, kind of about monsters coming back from the land and having to deal with them. So the first chapter has this monster that's wandering around the bay and everyone's sort of like, what do we do about it? And But there's nothing really to do because it's just crying and walking around. <laughs> um, uh, and then I also do poetry. So if you happen to be a poet and you want to come to the scene making workshop, that's a good place to start and kind of put images and stuff next to each other. Um, that's really all I have for you. I also do illustration, so if you hire me for illustration, that'd be cool. I love, I love being able to pay for things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Illustration is the illustration of our current gathering citation right now. It's an amazing, amazing. Thank you for that, Wes. Uh, and I'd like to actually. I want to call Soleil up here. Just come. Just come up now. Just come up now. Just come up now. I'm gonna read. I'm gonna read the bio. But uh, sometimes we need to ask our friends help with the words in their language. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know how it is. You know, sometimes you just have to ask, right? Okay, you start. Okay. <laughs> Originally from. <laughs> on the border of Lake. <laughs> 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 so, Soleil Lunier lives and works in Jojaki, Montreal. Multi multidisciplinary artist combining voice, movement, and theater through performance art. She, they, intertwines the presence of the two spirit body and experimental audiovisual while taking inspiration from the cos cos cosmogony. cosmogony of the sacred spirit of the animals of the inner world. She, they, expresses through action a thought on silence, silences and languages that make action art evolve within the indigenous world as well as universally. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hi. <laughs> so uh, I come with no visuals, really raw, uh, as uh, me right now. Just so you know, Piekwagami Noat is uh, Innu from the lake and specifically from the Lac Saint-Jean in uh, Quebec. So in uh, the Innus, we uh, specifically, uh, well, we recognize ourselves by the water, um, um, sorry, the water place where we come from. I don't know how to say it properly in English, but uh, since I am from the Lac Saint-Jean, uh, the Piekwagami we call is so yeah, <laughs> I'm first, first of all, really, really, really grateful to be here and have been invited to be in this residency um, this time around. I'm a person of few words. Um, I always find it challenging to be in front of people like that talking in uh, not only a settler's language, but also not even my first language. So thank you for being patient and 
sometimes I might be searching for my words. Um, so, originally I've been, well, I was invited to talk about my work from last night. Um, so for those who have seen it or uh, have not, anyway, uh, I performed at uh, the show at the, uh, prior to the Sunny Notes, Nutty Nose Res <laughs> Kids, Nutty Nose Res Kids uh, show. Um, yeah, I'll sit down. <laughs> I laugh a lot because uh, it breaks the silence. <laughs> but um, I, um, it's funny because my, my bio is kind of old. I have to update it. But um, I talk often about silence being one of the first source of inspiration for my work. Um, and uh, because in my family, um, and the, the communication was in silence, basically, or what we call silence. Uh, with my dad, with, uh, we, didn't, we didn't speak a lot. We just needed to be present with one another to, to understand and um, walk through life. And uh, I don't know, the communication was easier that way anyway. Because no matter what words I'm going to say, you're going to understand it or interpret it into your own way. And it's never going to be the same as the way I'm, I'm meeting or wanting to bring them across. So silence was extremely present. Lately, very recently actually, um, I was trying to uh, find a word for uh, one of my sh performances that I was going to make and uh, we have an Innu dictionary online. <laughs> uh, so I looked up silence and it doesn't exist. <laughs> uh, it's not a word. But uh, for noise, there's over uh, 150 words. Uh, so it's, it's, so silence is so much part of life that it actually doesn't exist, it's just there. So listening and noises are part of life, right? So it's not, the, the actual communication is through uh, the territory, through the sounds of nature and uh, the noises that surrounds us. So, it was already there that the communication was not needed words to be present, right? That silence is already talking for itself. Does it make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm starting by saying that because I find it easier to bring to the work that I did this time, but I also do, um, uh, well, that's when I, I, um, I am asked <laughs> to do a work like this. So, um, at the, the piece I did last, last night, uh, I, I've never done before, so that was the, um, I made or I brought with this territory and uh, the help of the elements that was brought to me. Um, the, the wolf skin that I had uh, with me was, uh, uh, is a friend of mine that brought it to me uh, for my uh, other performance uh, about uh, two weeks ago, and she uh, she thought I needed it for this performance, and then she said, keep it for the summer. So I felt a responsibility to bring it with me wherever I go, and continue to work with it, and for each other to uh, to get to know uh, ourselves. Um, so that's why I had it with me, and the communication continues with one another in that way too. Um, the first time I had it, I actually gave birth. It was a, a birthing uh, ceremony on stage, and I had a lot of women around me supporting the birth, and uh, as a big scream to to life and to continuation. Um, and yesterday's work, um, when I imagined myself, I first saw myself uh, more inside it instead of me having it inside me, so giving birth, but maybe it being... Uh, the body of, so like um, I had help uh, kind of envisioning, but that the the image of of, um, of it maybe giving birth to me, or it maybe uh, transcending me in other ways. Um, but this is one thing, but it doesn't give the message, or doesn't like uh, talk about this territory. And for me, it's very important to talk about the place where I'm going to do the performance and uh, what it means to surround it. So when I want to come back, uh, sorry if I don't make sense, sometimes I jump from one thing to the other, but uh, when I want to go 
come back to the territory, I go back to the trees. And when I want to go back to the trees, I often go back to uh, the driftwoods. Um, because for me, uh, driftwoods are the bones of this land, of the, the earth, the bones of the earth. So they're the ancient beings that have grown for years and I've seen so many things pass by. They fall into water, our biggest source of like elements, and then they get eaten by water, slowly, slowly like um, transforming into bones and then just end up on the shore for us to either forget or get eaten by other things or be taken. And they do look like bones and I since on the shore of my lake, there's so much driftwood. And when I was young, the people went, sometimes went into the water. It's a, it's a big lake, so much that people say it's a, inside the sea. Yeah? So you can't see the other side. So people go when they're in the middle and there's a storm coming up, they don't come back. But when I was young, the image of them not coming back is one thing. But what I was com seeing uh, coming back on the shore was the, this those bones, so there were the, the bones of this land, the bones of those people that just passed away in the water. So I decided and I wanted to have a driftwood for that piece, and I didn't know why. So I went by the water, uh, and Chelsea helped me to go get a piece. And, uh, you know, walking by the shore, you see a lot of wood, but you don't have the connection right away, right? And then suddenly there's this piece that spoke to me, and um, that I felt like they need to take it. So I, I took the piece that looked a little bit like a snake, but didn't make the connection right away, but it did look like a snake, so I took it. And as soon as we walked out of the, of the, the wood, there was a snake there, there was a rattlesnake waiting in the same position, exactly as the wood I just picked up, which is beautiful. So the, the connection to the snake came up. And one year ago, <laughs> Uh, one year ago, when I was in a ceremony, I had this, um, I had a connection with the snake and transformed to a snake, or whatever. And um, I got scared of myself because I was so empowered. I was empowered and I was like in control of everything, so much so that I lost the control of everything. And I, I had trouble keeping myself down uh, to the ground and uh, I felt nauseous, I didn't want to be there anymore, and I was scared of myself, I was scared of everybody, and I got really, really... It, it was a very difficult time for me, and I didn't uh, want to approach the snake again since then, but then it appeared to me. And maybe I felt that I was ready to approach it, but I couldn't approach it by myself. So then I felt, oh, so the four-legged is supposed to help me approach this being and this snake energy within me. Um, and that comes from this land. We don't have those types of snakes uh, where I come from. So I wouldn't have been having this uh, back home. Um, so, so yeah, so when I went, so I brought the, the, the wood that it took a couple of days before coming into my room. I worked in my room because I'm a loner. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, so, I, and when it arrived in my room, I felt so nauseous, I couldn't be in my room for a long time, and when I went to my room, I forgot my key inside, so I couldn't get back in. <laughs> that was, uh, <laughs> so I had to go, anyway, it was an <laughs> adventure. <laughs> Fucking snake. <laughs> anyway, um, so, yeah, so I went back, uh, finally went in the room, but I worked with the wolf first, and... Uh, for a very long time, actually, I just worked with the wolf, and suddenly, when I felt comfortable with the skin and with the wolf, I could approach the wood and start working with it, uh, this energy. And, um, yeah, so that was the, the, the thing. So for the performance yesterday, um, how I approached the, the stage, I, I wanted to be uh, protected by the wolf for the first part of it, making sure that I felt the energy properly, so that's why I wanted to be there before people arrived under the skin, so I was under the skin before and feeling its energy. It was actually extremely hot and very difficult, and uh, I did a lot of, I, I do a lot of long performances and, and resistance, actually, and I, I usually don't, you know, it goes through, but yesterday, I was really in pain. <laughs> the most I've been in a long time, and, and I, like, and that was not, 
like uh, something difficult for me. I thought it was going to be easy, you know, but it was so hard. I think that I needed to sweat it off again, and actually, I felt nauseous, I was sweating, I was scared, everything was numbing, my entire body was kind of dying under there, and I felt like, hey, am I going to just like faint there? But I thought of the people that supports me and that was there for me, and it's just, I think it's all the energy of the snake and all that I've been through with it that, that was um, that was so difficult. But then, um, the way, since in my performances, I try to just trust the energy of the people and the energy of what's going to happen, um, I've, uh, yeah, I, I've just read through and thought of the people that supported me and, like, because we can't do this alone, right? I, I could not do this alone, so I just... Uh, I, I, I went into the power of community, <laughs> and uh, and um, yeah, and the the words of uh, of uh, silence, the words of, of noises that came through, and uh, and um, I don't really remember exactly what happened during the performance, um, since the connection is vertically and not as horizontally as it is right now. I, I had an idea of where I was going with it, in the sense that I knew a little bit where I was going, what was going to happen. But um, I, I, um, I trusted the power of of the wolf, of the space, of the breathing, and of the voice to to help me to go through that. And uh, and uh, the I'm thankful actually because. Through my art, I feel like I'm healing myself a lot while healing others. Uh, I feel it's it's a it's a extremely em empowering and and uh, and uh, 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 I don't know the words, but <laughs> uh, it, it's extremely uh, uh, humbling to to uh, to be able to do that, and that people accepting me doing it. Uh, like being able to share uh, this experience of of healing and being able to to have the witness and being witness myself of my own path, right? So so I feel that I I invite people to be witness with me of this like journey and where I'm going. And uh, yeah, does that make sense? <laughs> I love <love> that. <laughs> so um, yeah, so so that was that was what. Um, went through with this performance yesterday and uh, how I came about with uh, this uh, piece. Um, I will not reproduce this piece. It, wouldn't, it would probably be impossible to do so anyway. Uh, but the skin is going to follow me for the rest of the summer and seeing where it takes me and, and, where, and what journey we're going to take each other, basically. Um, so, yeah. That's that about yesterday. <laughs> and uh, if not, <laughs> uh, I, I do, if, just as me as an artist, I, I vacillate through um, types of um, performances, let's say. I go from like uh, more like yesterday, more like on the spot performances that are not fully planned, but are just like coming with like dreams and visions and and things, and I have some shows that are more uh, specific one-hour uh, performances uh, that are half theatrical movement, body and voice, poetry um, types uh, that evolve involves more multimedia. Uh, so uh, one of my pieces called Umanishish is uh, the uh, moose fetus. Um, and uh, it has um, interactive um, visuals behind. And if I am not in the space, the visuals does not exist. So I have to be present for it to appear. So it's a real, a real uh, communication between uh, um, the visions and and the body. Uh, and uh, so trying to to bring the since I work a lot with this uh, the the vision things. Oh no, I'm done. So you can go <laughs> check. <laughs> Alright, I'm going to try not to laugh in the mic. <laughs> uh, so now I'm done. <laughs> no. Uh, <but laughs> yeah. you, can, you can check up uh, like <laughs> a little bit more of my work on my website or ask me questions about it if you're curious. So that's, uh, that's it. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you.